can invite you to open your Bibles uh, up to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. As we resume this journey through this wonderful gospel. Luke chapter 7, we're only going to read uh, verses 18 to 23. So if you can have it open. Luke chapter 7, verses 18 to 23. Reading from the ESV. Now the disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. This is God's word. Our passage this morning, it really shines the light on a very important subject and the subject of doubt. More specifically, it shines the light on the believer's doubts, the believer's doubts. And when you hear even that statement, it sounds like a contradiction in terms, doesn't it? The believer's doubts. And yet it is a reality. Very much so. I want you to think about an instance for a moment. Uh, Mark chapter 9 and Jesus, he comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration and there's a crowd amongst the disciples and there's chaos ensuring at the bottom of the mountain. And a father comes to Jesus with a son and and this young boy, this young man, he is demon-possessed. Now, this is one of the most severe cases of demon possession that we see in all the New Testament. Listen to what this dad says to Jesus about his son. He he says, the demon seizes him, it throws him to the ground, it makes him gnash his teeth, it makes his body stiff like a board, it sends him into convulsions and seizures. Even as he was speaking, it says, the son began to foam at the mouth. And the father says, the demon makes my boy throw himself in the water and the fire to destroy him. And he says this has been happening since he was just a young boy. So it seems like at this point, the lad's a teenager. When you think about that situation, if you're that parent, how on earth do you take a son like that out in public? How do you take him anywhere? How do you survive in your own household when the boy is so violent to himself and so violent and dangerous to all the members of the house? The father says to Jesus, I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't cast out the demon. And he says, please, if there's anything you can do, have compassion, help us, help us. And Jesus responds, all things are possible for the one who believes. And then the father utters those famous words, I believe, help my unbelief. Right? Faith that still struggles with doubt. This is faith that's struggling to trust. We know this, don't we? We we know this. We get this. We've been there. Some of you in this room might be there already presently. This morning in our text, we see the believer's doubt and we're going to look at the causes of it and we're going to look at the cure of it. So before we dive in to these words, would you bow with me as we ask God's help? It's an important subject. How God, as your word is now opened, 
Lord, please may you bring great, great um, clarity. Your word is not unclear, but our minds are foggy and we have baggage. And so, God, we pray, Lord, that heaven would back this message and we pray that it may come with the power of God and we pray for each of us as we think about these things, hear these things, Lord, that you would open us up and that you would help us to receive it. And God, may you bring great help to your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I said uh, at the beginning we can divide uh, the passage really into two. So firstly, this morning, let us consider the causes of a believer's doubt, the causes. Now, Luke here, in this passage, he turns our attention back to John the Baptist. Now, John was so prominent at the beginning of Luke's gospel in the opening chapters. Chapter 1, his birth was foretold by the angel Gabriel to Zechariah. Chapter 1, John is then born to his elderly parents. Chapter 1, it tells us that he grew up strong in the spirit. And then he lived in the wilderness till his ministry. Chapter 3, again, we are confronted with John's ministry before we're confronted with Jesus' ministry. John's ministry preceded Jesus. And John came to prepare the way for Jesus. He came to prepare the people for the Messiah. Israel at this time was very much like their forefathers. They were stubborn. They were rebellious. And they were unbelieving. Israel was hardened to God. And John comes in like a hammer to break up the hard soil. He comes in like a mallet, like a mattock to break up this rocky ground. And he smashes and smashes. He was truly a wrath and hellfire preacher. John called the people to repent. He baptized Jesus. He then called Herod to repent of his wickedness and it resulted in him being thrown into prison. Now after that, all in chapter 3, Luke then spent the next four chapters on Jesus. That's what we've been seeing, chapter after chapter. But now Luke returns back to John the Baptist. And we're going to see why. It's really important. Look at verse 1 with me. Then... The disciples of John reported all of these things to him. So during John's ministry, he had many followers and many disciples. And we've seen that a disciple is a student, a pupil, a learner. In John chapter 3, verse 26, John's disciples call him their rabbi. He's been their teacher. But once Jesus' ministry kicked off, many of John's disciples made the natural transition of becoming Jesus' followers. But some of them still remained disciples of John, and they even now go and visit him in prison. Now, Jesus, while this is happening, he's preaching, he's doing extraordinary miracles, his fame is spreading everywhere. That's how our passage ended last week in verse 17. His fame is going out. Jesus is on the front page of the news. He's in the headlines. You cannot be living in northern Israel and not know what Jesus has just been doing, unless you're John. Unless you're John. He's been in prison at this point now for many, many months. He hasn't seen the daylight for a long time. He hasn't seen Jesus for a long time. And there's only really two outcomes that are now before John. One, either a long and grueling imprisonment, or two, a violent execution. And we know what happens. But Luke says here, John's disciples went to visit him and they went to visit him at Herod's fortress. Now, uh, Reese, I just have a, um, the slide here for you to see. Um, the site there on the left, um, this is where Herod's uh, palace was. They've excavated, archaeologists have found it. The place is called Machaerus, and it's in modern-day uh, Jordan, uh, which is about 25 kilometers southeast of the Jordan River. You can see there on the side 
what they found is uh, at the fortress, one of what they believe one of the cells. So in that photograph, you may be looking at John the Baptist's prison cell. Um, it's not very like the prisons that we have today. Just the next slide, just to give you a bit of perspective here, just to see a map. Now, Jesus, we've seen he's up north. He's doing all of these miracles around Capernaum, around that region. John's disciples are there, and you can see all the way down with the ring around it to the right, you can see Machaerus. So they travel, John's disciples travel all the way from up north down to Machaerus, just to the side there um, of the Dead Sea, to, to bring a report to John. Thanks, Rhys. So they've traveled here over 100 kilometers by foot, but they come for more than a visit. It says they came to report to John all these things. What things? Jesus' teaching influence and everything that we saw last week, right? How he healed the centurion servant, uh, servant and how he raised the dead young man in the town of Nain in the middle of the funeral. Remember, both of those miracles we saw, they were in the presence of great crowds because they were all following Jesus. And the reports going out everywhere. There is a buzz. There is an excitement. There's anticipation in Israel at this moment. It's fever pitch. There is excitement and everyone is excited except for John. Except for John. Look at verse 19. And John calling two of his disciples to himself, he sent them to the Lord saying, Are you the one who is to come or shall we look to another. It's shocking, isn't it? It's a shocking message. Now, we would expect some such doubt maybe from a young person who's been raised in the church and then they go off to university and their, their uni professors who are atheists start challenging them. And, and maybe our young people would get a bit rattled. Or maybe we would expect this kind of doubt from a brand new convert who starts hearing other things. But, but never from John, not John the Baptist. Not John. I mean, what have we seen? He was conceived by elderly parents. It was a supernatural miracle, just like Isaac was for Abraham and Sarah. What did it say of John? The angel Gabriel in chapter 1, verse 15, and John shall be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. In the womb he had the Holy Spirit. He was the prophet of God. He was the greatest man ever born of a woman, Jesus said. He was a preacher. He was the forerunner of Jesus. He baptized Jesus. And then he saw the Holy Spirit descend like a dove on Jesus' head. And then he heard the audible voice of God from heaven. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. It's John. And now this John says to his disciples, I want you to travel all the way back to where you came from and give a message to Jesus and tell him, John says, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? It's shocking, right? Last week we saw in the passage the most unexpected um, faith, right, with the centurion. Here we see the most unexpected doubt. The most unexpected, side by side. And yet, if you survey the scriptures, it's not as shocking as we first conclude. Abraham is called in the New Testament the father of faith. God calls him as a pagan out of his idolatrous land. He hears God's voice. He leaves his land. He packs up everything to go to a place he's never heard of. God says, go there. And then God says to him, you will be the father of many nations. And Abraham doubts. He says, how can this be? For I am childless. And God says, look up at the stars, Abraham. If you can count them, so you'll be able to count all of the descendants I'm going to give you. And then Abraham believes. He believes. What about Moses? Moses approaches the burning bush. He sees a manifestation of the presence of God. Moses talks to God and he hears God. And God says to him, I'm going to send you to Egypt and you're going to deliver my people and bring them back here. And what does Moses say? Me, this is wonderful. 
Who am I that you should call me? When do we go? No, Moses, he doubts God and says, I can't do that. I can't rescue them. Not me. And he even cries out to God, send my brother Aaron with me to talk. He doubts God. And then we have Gideon. The angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and he says, you mighty warrior. I'm raising you up and I'm going to use you to defeat the Midianites. I'm going to use you. And Gideon, he doubts and he says, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. And God keeps reassuring him. And Gideon keeps saying, I can't do it. And God says, yes, you can. I'm going to be with you. And then Gideon, he still doubts God. And he says, give me a sign so that I may know. And God patiently gives him this miraculous sign with the wool, right? And then after that sign, he still doubts. And he says, give me a second sign just to confirm it. Friends, what do all three of those names have in common? Abraham, Moses, Moses and Gideon. All three of them are mentioned in Hebrews 11 as heroes of the faith, in the hall of faith. But this is, this is common, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. Zechariah, the man of the moment, right? The angel Gabriel came to him and says, you'll have a son, a prophet of the Most High God, to turn the people of Israel back. What are Zechariah's first words? How shall I know this will be? He doubts. He doubts straight away. And what about Thomas? What about Thomas? That poor fellow who earned himself the permanent nickname, Doubting Thomas. Right? Jesus appears to all the other disciples and they tell Thomas, we have seen Jesus. He appeared to us. And what does Thomas say? Unless I see and unless I put my fingers in his scars, I will not believe. Poor Thomas, the crucifixion had absolutely crushed him. And now he struggled with doubts. And I think it's unfortunate that he's called Doubting Thomas. Why? Because if we're going to be accurate and apply the rule, the whole lot of them should be called the Doubting Twelve. The whole lot of them. Because that's what we read the disciples. What about when the women go to the empty tomb and they bring the report back to the disciples? Do they believe the women? No, they don't. What do they do? They go and grab their old fishing nets and they go and grab their old boat and they go back to their old trade. They go back on the lake. And then what about the disciples on the road to Emmaus? After news is spreading, right? Jesus has been raised and they're walking with Jesus and they're moping and they're moping. And what does Jesus say? Oh, foolish ones, why are you so slow to believe all that the scriptures have said? Why are you still doubting? This has all been written. And then we come to the captain himself of the disciples, Peter, the leader of the disciples. In Matthew 14, they're all in the boat and they see Jesus walking on the raging seas. And they're terrified. And Peter says, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come. And Peter has faith in Jesus to step out of the boat and he starts walking on the water. And then he turns his eyes from Jesus and he looks at the wind and he looks at the waves and he starts to sink. And Jesus, what does he say when he pulls him out of the water? He says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why? You know, there's something remarkable here with all of those names, Abraham, Moses, Gideon, Zechariah, Thomas, Peter. What did they all have in common? They were all believers. All of them, they were believers who at some point struggled with doubt. What about John the Baptist? Was he a believer? He absolutely was. He pointed to Christ. He preached Christ. He praised Christ. He is the coming one. He is a lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He was a believer. In the next verses, Jesus declares him a believer before the, all the crowds. You see that next week. But all of a sudden, doubts crept in. And, and what, what brought about these doubts for John? I mean, what caused this sudden doubt in a man who was previously so bold, so fearless, so confident and firm? Where did these doubts come from? I think there are a couple of reasons. Reason number one, John's expectations. His expectations. What was John expecting Jesus to do? We don't have to guess. Just listen to his sermons. What did he preach? Judgment is coming. 
It's on the way. The mighty one is coming. I baptize you with water, but one is coming. He'll baptize you with the spirit and with fire. He'll baptize you with the spirit. He'll make you one body through salvation, but he's going to baptize with fire, unquenchable fire, those who are wicked. He said, the axe is already laid at the root of the tree. Every tree that does not bear fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What else did he preach? The winnowing fork is in the Messiah's hands. He's threshing his floor. He's going to gather the wheat into his barn house and he's going to grab the chaff and he's going to burn them with unquenchable fire. John preached the wrath of the lamb. And now John's in prison saying, where is it? Where is it? What are the reports John is hearing? Jesus is healing everyone. Jesus is having compassion to a rebellious Israel. Jesus is even mercifully healing Gentiles. Jesus is healing those who aren't even his followers. And John's thinking, where is the axe? Where is the fire? Where is the wrath of God? Where is it? And more than this, Jesus hadn't overthrown Israel's enemies. He hadn't. What did John so boldly proclaim? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The Messiah's rule is about to start. Get on board or you will be left behind. And now he's thinking, how on earth is this glorious rule of Messiah going to be set up while all the, while all the enemies of Israel are still on thrones? Caesar is still reigning. Pontius Pilate is still on the throne. Herod is still ruling. John is his prisoner. And the religious leaders whom he called a brood of snakes, they're still running around moving all the pieces. Jesus hadn't overthrown Israel's enemies yet. You know, John, he grew up preparing for this. John grew up anticipating and expecting this. John grew up hearing the prophecy of his father, Zechariah. Zechariah, he prophesied these words. Chapter 1, verse 68, remember? God has raised up a horn of salvation for us. Verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Verse 74, that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve God without fear. Zechariah was a priest. He taught the scriptures, but this was his greatest sermon ever. Every word was given by the Holy Spirit. He was prophesying. This was his sermon. He taught the scriptures, but he raised John on this prophecy. This was the most important moment of his life. John knew this. John prepared for this. He proclaimed this and Jesus wasn't doing any of it. And so the doubts creep in and we have to ask the question, if Jesus didn't do these things, did Zechariah prophesy incorrectly? Did John the Baptist preach wrongly? And the answer is a resounding emphatic no. No, they didn't. Jesus will deliver his people from all of their enemies, just as Zechariah prophesied. Jesus will baptize the wicked with unquenchable fire, just as John had preached. What didn't these two men realize? That there are two comings of the Messiah. There's two comings. Yes, they were prophets, but God didn't give them all the details. He didn't. That doesn't belong to man. It belongs to God. And so the first coming of Jesus wasn't for destroying the enemies of God. It wasn't for casting them into hell. The first coming of Jesus was for seeking and saving the lost. The second coming would be judgment day when the Messiah starts hurling people into the lake of fire and treading on his enemies. See, John expected the fire overthrowing of Rome to happen all now, but... Nothing of the sort was happening and doubts are arising. And to add to all of this, he is suffering in prison. On top of all of that, listen, injustice and persecution are like fertilizer over doubt. It really is. Remember John famously said those words, he must increase 
and I must decrease. But I wonder if John knew what he was actually saying. I mean, the extent of what he was saying. That's John in this moment, and doubt has now sprung up like a weed amongst the flowers of his faith. And we look from John and we turn to us and we say, what about us? Why do we as Christians fall into doubt? Why? Why is that? I think there's a couple of reasons here. Firstly, similar to John, because of expectations. Expectations we have with God. We hit a crisis and we have expectations of God. Something bad comes our way and we cry out, God, fix it. And most of the time, he doesn't come with the instant fix. He doesn't. And friends, we misunderstand our relationship with him. It goes something like this. I've heard it many times. I am God's child and he is my father. Now, if I was God and one of my dear ones was suffering or was crying out to me, I would speedily and immediately relieve them of their pain. What's the problem? Our relationship to God is different to our relationship to our children. It really is. There is something that comes before our wishes and desires. And what is that? It is God's will and it's his glory. It's his will and it's his glory. We misunderstand our relationship with God because so often our, our theology is more shaped by experience than the scriptures. Let me say that again. Our theology is often more shaped by our experience or experiences than scripture. You know, pastors and preachers, they love stories. Love to tell stories. You know, 25 minutes of stories and illustrations, seven minutes of making comments about the Bible. But we hear all of these stories about what God has done for others. We hear what he's done. Someone says, I lost a job, but God ended up giving me a better one. I got this diagnosis and God healed me. My, my relationship broke down, but then he restored it perfectly and it's better than it's ever been. And now we hear those things that God has done and that begins to become our expectation. Our expectation, not the Bible, not the scriptures, but people's experiences and testimony. Now bear with me for a moment while I contradict myself for a second and share a quick story. In seminary, in honesty, I nearly, nearly failed my preaching subject. Nearly failed, got through by the skin of my teeth and the rest of the class was soaring. Why was that? Well, maybe because I was brand new at the college, whatever. But I would get feedback. I'd get feedback forms and I'd get my report at the end of each semester regarding this subject. And the report said, not enough stories, not enough illustrations. Not enough stories. And the comments, people need stories. People want stories. You cannot keep their attention without stories. Why is Christianity in the shape that it's in today? I'm going to submit to you. It's because we are deep in stories and we are shallow in the Word of God. Please hear me. When our view of God is shaped by experience and stories and not the Word of God, we will be disillusioned with God. We will invite doubt in our lives because we will become disappointed with God. We will. He did it for them, but He didn't do it for me. He should have done this. We cried for it, but he didn't. And friends, this is especially true when we face suffering. You know, when sickness, terrible sickness comes into our lives, when loss, grievous loss comes into our life, grief and sorrow, unimaginable. And then it's compounded when you look out and you see that other people have an easier cross to bear than ourselves. And we look at that and nothing, nothing unsettles a calm soul like suffering. Nothing does. Friends, doubt the size of a mustard seed can grow into the biggest tree of the field 
And you know when it can grow like that? When Christians isolate themselves. When they isolate themselves. Remember, the context here, John has been in prison for many, many months now. He has no fellowship. He's all alone. He hasn't seen his brothers and sisters and Jesus hasn't visited him once. He's alone and isolation for believers is fertile ground for the enemy to begin to sow the seeds of doubt. It is. See, when calamity hits a believer, the immediate temptation is to isolate ourselves. It is. But that's why the scripture says in Hebrews 10.25, do not forsake meeting together as is the habit of some, but rather encourage one another. Meet. Don't hide out. Well, doubt crept into John's heart unexpectedly, suddenly, subtly like, like a water leak. It came in. We've considered the causes of a believer's doubt. Now let's turn and carefully digest the cure, the cure for a believer's doubt. Now, John sends his disciples back to Jesus with his message, and notice his disciples relay John's message word for word, word for word. Look at verse 20. And when the men had come to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Now we must not miss what's happening here. John has just taken the first step in being delivered from his doubt. He's just taken the first step. And you think, how? How has he? Look at him. He's expressing his doubt. Let me ask you the question, where has John taken his doubts? He has taken them straight to Jesus. He's gone straight to Jesus. He doesn't wait for truth to come to him. He doesn't take his doubt to the professionals of his day. No, he takes his doubts straight to Jesus Christ. Straight to the Lord. Can I encourage you? If doubts are flooding in your life, don't go running and telling anyone and everyone. Because understand this, doubt can be more contagious than the flu. Don't do that. There is only one safe place to take them. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus with your prayers. Go to Him immediately. And never says He has any opening hours. Why? Because His office hours never close. He's always available. Take them straight to Jesus. That's where John goes. Jesus receives John's message, a telegram entitled Doubt. And the message says, are you the coming one or should we look for another? Can I just ask you, imagine how Jesus felt when he received that message. Imagine the blow that this hit to our Lord. Imagine the blow. I mean, in John chapter 7, his own siblings doubted him. When he preached one of his first sermons in his hometown in Nazareth, they all rejected him and tried to throw him off a cliff. His disciples were so slow and always doubting. But this one here, this one here cut our Lord Jesus very, very deep. This was John. This was his cousin. But more than a cousin, this was his co-laborer. This was the one who rolled out the carpet for him. This was the forerunner of Jesus Christ to bring in the kingdom. And Jesus hears John saying, Jesus, I'm not sure you're really who I thought you were anymore. I'm not sure. The pain Jesus knew. The grief Jesus knew. This was prophesied long ago, Isaiah 53, verse 3. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. man of sorrows. Let me ask you, have you ever received a message maybe a phone call, a text or an email that absolutely knocked the wind out of you. I mean, the message comes through. It's a crushing criticism or it's a merciless rejection or it's harsh words. You know, that message comes through. What do you want to do in that moment? You want to do one of two things. One, you want to just curl up in a ball, fall on the floor. I can't do the rest of today's tasks. I can't move. Or two, you want to return fire. You want to deliver a harsh word back and you want to put them in their place. Friends, Jesus does neither of those things. He does the opposite. The good shepherd, he leaves the 99. 
He goes after the one. Look, verse 21. In that hour, Jesus healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. What does Jesus do? He continues to do his Father's will. He continues his mission, and he begins repairing John. He begins repairing John. When did Jesus do this sudden wave of miracles? Just there, when? When? What? It says there in verse 21, in that hour, at that time. What hour? What time? When he had just received the message, when John's disciples were standing in front of him, then he does this wave of miracles. He does it in front of their eyes. They're going to be eyewitnesses to the extraordinary power of God coming out of Jesus. He does it right then when they come. And then Jesus tells them, he tells them this, Jesus says, you need to go right back to where you came from. I'm sending you back to John. You need to go back to Machaerus. And I want you to pass on a message to John. I have a message for John. Look at verse 22. And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. Jesus passes on. Two quotes from the Old Testament to John. He takes it from here, Isaiah 35, verses 5 to 6. It says, The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf, un deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Isaiah 61, 1 is in here. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. And even in this message is allusions to Isaiah 26, 19, Isaiah 29, 18, and Malachi. What Jesus is doing, this wasn't just prophesied in an isolated, obscure text. This was scattered through the Scriptures. What you have seen and heard, Jesus tells us. And, and we here, as we've been going through the, the book of Luke, we've seen and heard this, haven't we? The lame walking, remember, in, in, in Luke Chapter 5, the paralytic who was lowered through the roof. Jesus told him to pick up his mat. We saw the leper cleanse. Remember in chapter 5, and the leper says, Jesus, if you're willing, make me clean. Jesus says, I am willing. I am willing. And he heals him. And then the dead raised. We saw last week in the town of Nain when Jesus stops the funeral and raises that young man. And, and the, the, the poor receiving good news, the poor having good news preached to them, what have we seen in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. He gave good news to the poor. You know, the Jews in that day, the high-ranking Jews, they notoriously mistreated, mistreated and neglected the poor. You remember? They were even will willing for a poor widow to put her last coin in the tithing box. They, they, they were happy for that. Happy to watch that. They saw the poor as inferior. How did Jesus see the poor? He saw the poor as those whose souls would live as long as the rich man's soul. The poor, the poor might have harder access to many things in life than the rich, but they must not have harder access to the good news. And he gave it to them. And Jesus sends them back to John with this message. Where does Jesus direct this doubting believer? He directs him straight to the word of God. He directs him straight to the Scriptures. He quotes the Old Testament. He, show how, he shows how the Old Testament reveals what the Messiah is supposed to do. And Jesus is saying, I'm doing it. I'm fulfilling it. And when John's disciples returned to him with this message, all of a sudden, all of those Old Testament passages came flooding back into his mind. Flooding. He remembered them. Why? Because he knew them. His father Zechariah had raised him in the Scriptures. He knew this. And Jesus reminds him, what's happening to John in this moment? What's happening? He was assaulted with doubts in his mind. And now the Word of God is coming back to him. And he is being transformed by the renewing of his mind. The Scriptures are coming back into his mind. And he's being transformed. Yes, even that preacher needed to be reminded of the Word of God. 
And this is, this is what the Word of God does. This is what it does. How many believers can testify, I was struggling, I was doubting, I was disappointed with God, I was sliding. And then the Word of God came to me. It came to me like a life raft. Maybe through a reading in the morning, a devotional, a text message or a sermon. And all of a sudden, the light began to shine and the darkness of doubt fled like the thief that it was. It ran for its life when the Word of God came in. Can I say this? It grieves me. It grieves me that many passages like this one are frequently misapplied by ministers who should know better. Who should know better. Doubt, they say, is so prevalent. Doubt overwhelms God's people. Jesus did so many miracles. This passage is teaching us that we should be seeking God for more miracles so that our doubts can be driven away. That is wrong. It misses the point completely. Absolutely. The Jews continued to see signs and miracles and they kept asking for more. Judas saw more miracles than anyone and it didn't help him. No, 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 no. Jesus says, John, you need to go back to the Word of God. You need to hear the Word. The truth that you seek is there. You need your expectations dictated by the Scriptures. All of them. All of them. The sure Word of God is what the troubled soul needs. And Jesus, don't miss Jesus signing words, signing off words to John. There's a P.S. at the end of his message. He leaves John with a beatitude. Look at verse 23. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. That word offended in the Greek is skandalizo, which is where we get the English word scandalized. Blessed is the one who is not scandalized or greatly offended by me. So many people were offended by Jesus. They ended up screaming out, crucify him. Why are they offended by him? What's there to be offended by Jesus? He wasn't the Messiah that they wanted. He wasn't the Messiah that they hoped for. He wasn't the Messiah that they expected. He wasn't. He didn't meet their expectations. Friends, unbelief is eternally deadly. But understand this, doubt is no less dangerous if it's not cured. It is no less, you might find doubt creeping in and if it goes unchecked, you might find yourself one day offended by Jesus. Offended. So let me close this with a huge question. It's really the elephant in the room. What ended up happening to John? After Jesus' message came through his disciples and the disciples had to go, what ended up happening to John? He had no more questions for Jesus. He didn't. There were no more messages from John to Jesus, John soon learns his fate. Herodias asks for a present, and it's his head on a plate, and he's beheaded. But Matthew 14, where it talks about his beheading, it ends with this small, tiny, significant detail. It says this in chapter 14, verse 12, he was beheaded, and then it says John's disciples came back to Machaerus. Verse 12, and John's disciples came and took his body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Why tell Jesus? If John is offended by Jesus, if John has given up by Jesus, there's nothing to tell Jesus. But they want to tell Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was John's Messiah. The doubt had been driven away. Tell Jesus, John finished the race. He's done. He's done. Tell, tell Jesus it's all finished now. He made it. John was re-strengthened by our Lord's encouragement and he was able to stare death in the face. And John, his reward was being welcomed into his internal inheritance. His eternal inheritance. He received his reward. And thus the words of Jesus were fulfilled. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. How blessed indeed is John in this very moment. How blessed is he? Let me tell you, to close here, 
Christian, take your doubts to Jesus. Take them to him and run to the scriptures. Don't get your theology from stories. Read the word of God. Get to know Jesus more. Get stuck in the word of God and he will chase out all doubt like a hound. He will chase it out. He loves his own. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your wonderful word. And Lord, as we look at John, to see the, the crisis that he faced and the doubts that crept in, we thank you for our Lord Jesus. What a great Savior he is. He is not willing that one of his own shall be lost. He is not willing. And that gives us great comfort. Great comfort. Great assurance. Lord, our faith goes up and down. And we're sorry for that. Lord, doubting, it's a sin. We shouldn't. But God, we thank you. We thank you that the scriptures that we can read, they all point to you and you've not left us in the dark. I pray for those who are doubting this morning, who are facing doubts because of circumstances. I pray that you would encourage them and revive their faith. And Lord, for all of us, as there are things just on the horizon for everyone, we pray that we might remember these things and we may run to Jesus. We pray this in our Lord's name. Amen.